Library Leadership Podcast is brought to you by Innovative. Focused on accelerating libraries' impact on the world, Innovative helps spark connections between libraries and their communities with a comprehensive portfolio of solutions for libraries worldwide. Innovative technology makes resources accessible to patrons near and far. Learn more at www.iii.com slash podcast. This is Adrienne Herrick-Juarez. You're listening to Library Leadership Podcast, where we talk about libraries and leadership and speak with guests who share their ideas, innovations, and strategic insights in the profession. Do you know what to do if you're faced with harassment or bullying in your library? According to Dr. Steve Albrecht, one of the nation's leading experts on library safety and security, many of us do not. Because of this, cases often go unreported, which can lead to unfortunate consequences. On this podcast, you'll learn about the importance of having policies in place to deal with bullying and harassment, how this is a training matter, and what the intervention process should look like in libraries. I hope you'll tune in for this important conversation. Enjoy the show. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you for talking with me today about preventing harassment and bullying in libraries. First off, will you share with our listeners what this is all about and how it can affect libraries? Well, back in 2000, I started working with libraries. I had originally been a workplace violence prevention specialist, and some libraries in California got a hold of me about safety and security. And one of the discussion points that came up with library staff, oftentimes on the breaks when I was doing the training programs, was, can I tell you about this guy who's been bothering me? And it turns out to be a, a patron issue where there was sexual or racial harassment. And it really was kind of a shadow concern where oftentimes managers and supervisors were not aware of it. The employee was kind of embarrassed by the behavior. They weren't sure whether they were saying the wrong things to this person, and they didn't really know where to turn to. So I started even 20 years ago, you know, kind of before the Me Too movement, to get a sense that it is kind of a shadow concern in libraries. We have a lot of women working in libraries, but I think the breakdown is like 70-30, female to male, or 80-20, uh, using some ALA library statistics in terms of gender. And so, it, it, you know, as a man, I don't oftentimes see the same behavior, and a lot of women were coming to me on my training programs and talking to me offline or sending me emails about, you know, fairly long stories about how they've been harassed by patrons. And, you know, sometimes we think about sexual harassment as kind of an employee-to-employee issue, but that was not the case. Sure, sure. It can be patrons. It can be within the workplace itself. So what are the types of harassment that can take place in a working environment? Most people think of sexual harassment as the primary issue that could take place between a boss and an employee. It could be it could be a dating type of a you know relationship where they ask for a dating relationship. Probably the one that's the most common is sort of the Harvey Weinstein Hollywood quid pro quo, which is you know Latin for this for that. Give me a sexual relationship and I'll, I'll allow you to continue to work here, or I'll hire you, or I'll make your path easier or more difficult. That's fairly rare in the libraries that, that I have worked with. I've not seen any of those types of cases. What I typically see is is not employee to employee or boss to employee, but patrons who harass, uh, it could be same-sex sexual orientation or male-female, uh, they'll harass the, the library employee. And it oftentimes starts out as, you know, flirting type of behavior or really kind of questions about, you know, are you dating, are you married, and, and it kind of continues. And then the harassment sometimes, you know, has a, a racial connection to it or a same-sex sexual orientation connection to it. So there's lots of, of possibilities. And then if you look at sort of the end stage or the worst case scenario, sometimes this harassment also leads into stalking behaviors. And I worked for the police department in San Diego for 15 years. I was a, a sergeant and a domestic violence investigator. And I worked on a lot of stalking cases involving, you know, people in dating relationships. And so it was more unusual to see stalking taking place as a behavior in the workplace where someone says, you know, if you're not going to go out with me, I'm going to make it my life's mission to make your life miserable or I'm going to show up in places, you know, where you don't expect me to be. So I would talk to library employees and they'd say, this guy, you know, followed me to the gym or he keeps harassing me in the parking lot or he showed up at the, at the grocery store I go to. And those cases are really kind of disturbing. Yeah, absolutely. So in your work, you talk about the importance of having updated and accurate policies to address these behaviors. What do libraries need to have in place? 
Well, the good news about the concept of, of harassment as a workplace issue is it, it's fairly mature. There's a lot of, of policy language that exists. It has a, a feel to it that it's been around for a long time, obviously, that, that we have policy. There's an investigative process for it. There is a, a discussion, especially as a new employee orientation piece, which we talk about you know, how important it is to report these things. And also that there are consequences for for perpetrators and support for victims. So, you know, a lot of times when you look at libraries as being a connection to a city or a county entity, it's, it's part of a city or part of a county, they can use the policies that exist, the written policies that exist in those city and county entities. Oftentimes those have been pretty well created and scrubbed down by the lawyers, you know, city attorneys, county council, things like that, to get the right kind of language. I oftentimes encourage library directors, supervisors, managers to look at their policy and say, is it up to date? Is it, is it, you know, are we connected now to where we are in the kind of real world, what's happening today in terms of our policy? And there's sort of a Goldilocks and the three bears kind of a feel for policies, you know, too long, too short, just right. 20 pages is probably too long, but one page is not enough. There's kind of a sweet spot in the policies that I have seen over the years that address what the concept of sexual harassment prevention is. And not only is there a city county, you know, relationship there to the subject is it's a, it's a federal law requirement. It's been around since 1964. The passage of the Civil Rights Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act made sexual and racial harassment illegal behavior in the United States in the workplace. So the idea that you know, managers and supervisors, directors can look at their own policy and say, can we borrow, steal, take from other policies that we see in other library districts that have good language in it, that have the kind of things that we need to be addressing? And can we also remind our employees that they may have some knowledge of this issue or not very much at all? You know, one of the things I typically see is if we hire younger employees in the library, they could be pages or assistants or part-time employees. They may be 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. This could be their first, quote, real job. They need just as much of an education about this as anybody else, and perhaps probably more so, just to remind them of what the boundaries are in the workplace. And so when I look at policies, and I do that as part of my consulting work, is let me go through this and kind of tighten it up and remove some of the language and add some things in. I'm always looking for some key basics, which are, does it address what sexual and racial harassment are, the type of behaviors, physical behaviors, verbal behaviors, things that, that we see, you know, photographs, things like that. And then do we address the investigative process? Do we address confidentiality? And one of the biggest pieces for me, especially with library staff, is this concept of multiple channels of reporting. You can go to your boss. You can go to your boss's boss. You can go to the person in charge. You can go to a frontline supervisor who's not necessarily your boss. You can speak to HR. You can speak to a city attorney or a county attorney that works for your, your agency. So there's multiple ways to report. From there, we have a, an investigative process, and that leads to either consequences for the, for the patron perpetrators and also support for the victims. That's good. And you mentioned education. How must employee training take place so that everyone is aware of the policies and how they are enforced? I think there's kind of an expectation with some employees that they already know this subject. And I teach webinars on this issue, and I teach a you know basic two-hour block. I do a lot of work in California libraries where there is a two-hour mandated requirement for training every two years for all supervisors and managers. It's also a mandate for all elected officials as well. So sometimes I get library boards in my programs, and there's kind of an expectation, that, oh, yeah, I know this stuff already. So I try to keep them on their toes in terms of the content and, and things that we talk about that may, they may not know about especially for this concepts of, like I talked about, multiple channels of reporting, and, and really how, as a supervisor, we, in, we not only talk about enforcing the policy, but we create a channel for people to report. And I always tell bosses, you can't fix what you don't know about. And I always tell employees in the library environment, you, you can't, we can't fix what you don't tell us. So one of the sort of more heartbreaking things I see in the subject of harassment of library employees is I will ask them, how long has this behavior been going on? They'll tell me six months or a year. And it's, it's painful for me to hear that these types of situations are not being addressed, oftentimes because the employee feels fearful. They fear retaliation from the person who is doing the harassing if it's a, it's a patron. Sometimes the person that's doing the harassing is kind of a noted figure in the community, which is sort of an odd, odd uh, intervention there. And also the idea that do we sort of brush across this as an orientation subject or do we spend some time talking about it? 
I always encourage managers and supervisors to have a once a year training program on the issue. Just pull the policy and say, you know, as a staff meeting, we're going to go over this and remind everybody what we're supposed to do. You know, maybe we spend an hour on it and head everybody off, you know, back to work. And then the other part is, is there anything that we can learn from cases in the news media, things that happen locally or nationally? The may or may not have a library connection to them around this issue of harassment, but we can learn from that. And you've been touching on this, but can you tell us about the employee reporting process and the supervisor intervention process? One of the difficulties I think supervisors have is they're not sure that there's a policy violation. And so that, I talk to them about that and say, if somebody comes to you with a situation that involves a patron and a, and a staff member or less, less possible or rare is the employee to employee situation of harassment, the first thing you have to think about as a boss is, is there a policy violation? Is this a conflict between two employees that doesn't have anything to do with sexual or racial harassment, or is this a clear violation of our policy? I think sometimes supervisors get, get trapped into, well, I'm not sure, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an HR expert, and I always say, then get the story from the employee, put a placeholder in that situation, say to the employee, let me talk to some people uh, in terms of our subject matter expertise about this and what can we figure out from here. So stand by until I get back to you. Then talk to human resources as a function of your organization. Talk to your boss, your boss's boss. Talk to the, the agency attorneys that, that handle these types of situations and say, let me run the scenario by you. Do we see a policy violation here? I'm on the fence as to whether or not there is one, or it seems pretty clear to me that there is a policy violation. From that point, we go forward with an investigative approach, which may involve looking at texts or emails that this patron may have sent to the staff member, including, you know, to their own personal cell phone. I encourage staff members to keep that stuff and to take screenshots of it so we can look at it. And then we also look and say, who may have witnessed this behavior as other employees? Who may have seen this type of, of behavior happening to our, our employee by, by this patron? And can we kind of talk to those people and figure out what's going on? So we're trying to look at the context and look at the content and figure out, is it a physical nature? Is it a is it a verbal nature? Is it a, you know, this person sending photographs or asking for photographs or, or asking this person out on a date or that type of thing that we clearly want to stop? And then we have to come up with a response to the patron as to this is a boundary that you cannot continue to cross if you want to come to our library. What does it look like when harassment and bullying prevention works well in the workplace? I think it's a morale issue. I also think it's a retention issue. We keep good people. We don't we don't drive away employees who are fearful to coming to work. Um, I see this a lot in, in some of the work I do in bullying, which is kind of a tough subject to define. We know it when we see it. We certainly know it, you know, from our schoolyard experiences. But when we have bullying happening in the workplace, whether it's a patron or employee to employee or worst case scenario, boss bullying employees, uh, people tend to leave. It's a it's a retention issue. We lose good folks. Uh, there's a morale concern. People are, you know, afraid to come to work, don't want to come to work, don't want to engage with certain certain patrons. And that's something I think that we look at as a success in the kind of the work culture that we create in the library. This is a fun place to work. We enjoy each other's company. We enjoy working for the patrons, but we have good boundaries. There's good physical boundaries with us and the patrons. We don't allow them to touch us in a harassing or sexual way. There's good verbal boundaries with patrons. We don't allow them to have certain kinds of conversations with our employees. And we really enforce those types of things with the idea that says this is for the benefit of the staff and for the new people coming in saying you don't have to tolerate this as an employee in our environment. We're, we're after it. We address it when we see it. We have strong feelings about keeping folks safe from this type of behavior. And I think, I think that's how we prove success. Anything else you'd like to share? Well, I, you know, I look at the kind of the landscape for the library, and I think that sometimes the people I talk to as staff members in libraries have a kind of a difficult time with some of their frequent flyers. These are people that come in all the time. They may be a little eccentric in their behavior. They may be a little bit odd in their behavior. And sometimes the staff members feel like they have to tolerate certain kinds of language or even touching or hugging or things like that. They don't want to have happen to them because this person is a longtime resident, longtime community member or one of our frequent flyers that comes in all the time. And I think supervisors have to look at the impact on the business and say, I don't care how long this person's been coming into the library. I don't care if they're the richest person in town. We have a requirement to set boundaries about how they engage with our staff. So I, I'm always disappointed, I guess not surprised sometimes that staff members let stuff go on and they don't report it because they feel like they won't be heard or they feel like this person's weight in the community may have more value than theirs as an employee, which is wrong. 
And then the idea that, you know, we've created a culture where people can come to work and feel okay about not having to deal with the subject at all. So if you look at places where you have worked in your own career, you say, wow, this was never an issue any place I've ever worked or it was an issue where I was and I knew how miserable it made me feel. I don't want to ever feel that way again. As the supervisors, I think we have a, a duty to create the kind of environment where this stuff just doesn't happen. So important. Do you have a favorite management or leadership book and why? I'm kind of old school. There's a, a writer in San Diego where I used to be named Bob Nelson. And Bob Nelson is claimed to fame. He's really well known for writing books about motivation and really well known for writing books about reward. And so one of his big bestsellers back in the day was A Thousand and One Ways to Reward Your Employees. I thought it was a really cool book. It has just literally a thousand and one ideas about how to do things for employees ranging from, you know, pizza day to announcing their success at a city council meeting or something like that. So so literally lots and lots of ways to catch people doing the right things in their jobs. And I think, you know, in this day and age, sometimes it's easy to take employees for granted and say, oh, you know, they, they know that they're doing a good job. We, you know, I, I tell them all the time when in reality, they don't remember the last time they get a lot of praise from their bosses. So I kind of like that book a lot. There's a book I use in my training all the time called Verbal Judo, and it's written by a guy named George Thompson. He had passed away several years ago. He was a cop in Tampa, Florida, and he's also a professor of rhetoric. And so he taught language and language skills, and and Verbal Judo is a really useful book for talking to people, especially under stress. Thank you for sharing those. They sound like great resources. And you've done a lot of work with libraries to help make them the best places possible. What do libraries mean to you personally? I've always been a book guy. I was an English major in college. I've written 23 books myself so far. I'm always writing columns or blogs or books, and, and words have been a huge part of my life since I was a kid. And I really put that on my parents. My parents took me to the library in San Diego, and this was back in the 70s, and they would drop me off all afternoon and say, you know, come back with as many books as you want to check out. And I think the limit was five back in those days, and I would come in with my five books. And they'd come out and check out the books for me. And I was in heaven till the next week when I would go back down again. And they would drop me off at the library and I would spend all day looking for stuff. So I think as a writer, and Stephen King has said this, that you have to be a good reader first. And whether you read anything at all in any topic makes you a better writer. And so my basis for being, I think, a fairly good writer is that I was a really good reader. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. It just warms my heart as a librarian. And Steve, thanks for sharing all of this information, too, about bullying and harassment and how we can prevent this in libraries. It's a really important issue. And like you say, if we don't do this, we will lose great people in libraries. So this work really means a lot, and I really appreciate your work in it. Thank you for being here. Thanks very much for having me. You've been listening to Library Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian herrick Juarez. Our producer is Nate Vineyard. More episodes can be found at libraryleadershippodcast.com, where you can now subscribe to have new shows delivered right into your email inbox. You can also find the show on Apple iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. We would like to thank the Park City Library for their dedicated support of this show. The opinions expressed on this show are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views of Library Leadership Podcast or our sponsors.